Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Geometry Colloquium. This is a weekly web series all about geometry processing. This colloquium aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. Every week, we will have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. And today, we are thrilled to have Yi Xing Fu as our opener to talk about the fast tetrahedral meshing in the wild and Nicholas Sharp as our headliner to discuss their research in intrinsic triangulation in geometry processing. And if there is any questions, uh, please leave comments in the YouTube live chat. And our opener, Yi Xing, is a computer science PhD student at New York University, supervised by Daniel Lee Pernozzo. And her research is very influential, especially since 2018, when she published a robust meshing algorithm called TETVAL, and this algorithm suddenly becomes the go-to method for getting a nice TET mesh or a surface triangle mesh. And this is extremely important for us uh, because before 2018, we only have a handful of nice meshes to evaluate our algorithm, but now we can easily use TETWAL to obtain hundreds of thousands of meshes to test our methods. And this is also important for geometric learning where we need to get a large amount of clean meshes to train our network. So her contribution uh, to the graphics is huge and is recognized by Adobe Research Fellowship and Jacob T. Strauss PhD Fellowship. And today she will be talking about her research in robust meshing. And without further ado, let's welcome Yi Xing. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Yeah, so um, hi everyone. Today I would like to introduce my recent work for generating tetrahedral meshes robustly and efficiently. In many cases, we need a nice volumetric representation for an object because, for example, we may want to simulate a physical object for collision test in manufacturing where we need its volumetric representation. Tetrahedral mesh is the most common way to represent the volume of a 3D object. Tetrahedral meshing is a practice to generate tetrahedral meshes or TET meshes in short. It takes as input the surface of an object and use tetrahedra to fill in the interior space of the surface and output the tetrahedral mesh with the input surface preserved. However, tetrahedral meshing is not an easy task. It has been a hard problem for a long time. One of the main reasons is the input surface in the real world is not perfect. Like the example shown here, this is a triangle surface mesh that consists, uh, that consists of around 31 million faces. And if we zoom in, we can see the surface is full of self-intersections. In its current pipeline, this model takes around two weeks of manual work to clean up. Know that it's really common that in choosing artifacts on the surface during the design procedure. So a robust tetrahedral mesh algorithm should be able to handle imperfect real-world inputs. We tested a collection of popular tetrahedral mesh algorithms on Thinking 10K dataset, which contains 10,000 real-world surface meshes, and plot out the surface, uh, the success rates of each method. The definition of success uh, here is the method outputs a 10 mesh within three hours using less than 32 gigabyte memory. As we can see in this plot, except the most recent method had wild on the right, the other method has low success, low success rate and uh, thus impossible to be used in automatic batch processing pipeline. These models can be um, categorized into three groups. The first is the line based method, which can be faithful, sorry, which can be faithful to the input surface, but can easily over refine or uh, fail if the input contains self intersections or other problems. Grid based methods can uh, achieve higher robustness, but struggle in preserving features in the input. Envelope based methods uh, allow the surface changing and being optimized within certain distance from the input and thus are way more robust and can produce high quality output. However, it's slow due to the usage of exact numbers, which is time consuming in computation. So we propose a new method, FTFLOUD, which is not only robust, automatic, able to produce high quality output, but also fast. The first three features are achieved by using envelope based mesh optimization. The efficiency is achieved by novel triangle insertion along with the uh, floating point construction. Now let's take a look at the pipeline of our, of our method. Um, the pipeline of FPET consists of two stages. In the first stage, 
uh, triangle insertion, we first build a background mesh, which is the head mesh of a box a bit larger than the input. Um, and then we insert the input triangles into the background mesh and always maintain a valid head mesh. When inserting the triangle, we first compute the intersection between the triangle and the edges in the mesh, and then subdivide the affected tetrahedron using the table-based method. Know that uh, when we compute the intersection, we use a snappy strategy since we always allow the surface changing um, inside an envelope in later stage. Knowing which edge, uh, knowing which edges has intersection, you uniquely define uh, the connectivity of new tetrahedron. And it's also true in 2D. Here is a 2D example. A triangle has three edges, so we can use a three-bit code for indicating which edge is cut or intersected. If no edge is cut, the code value is zero. If edge E1 is cut, for example, the code value turns to two. And we can do something similar in 3D. It's possible that um, some triangles cannot be inserted in the first round. So for these triangles, we will try to insert them during next stage mesh improvement, when the mesh quality gets better and the insertion gets easier. It's rare that input triangles cannot be inserted in the end. Based on our experiment on 10,000 models, it does not happen. The second stage is envelope-based mesh improvement. Here we optimized and integrate, integrated the local operations for mesh improvements and the um, energy computation for measuring element quality introduced in the Ted Wells paper. After the mesh improvement, we get our uh, output with inserted triangle approximated within an envelope. In the end, users can choose to uh, filter out outside elements. Users can choose to use uh, either winding number or flood field. Extending filtering allows us to do Boolean operations among multiple objects. For example, if we want to do Boolean operations between object A and B, we can directly input these two meshes to FTEC world. And then, for example, uh, for a difference operation, uh, FTEC world would output the elements inside surface A, but not inside the surface B. And of course, our Boolean operation can also be applied on multiple objects and operations at once, like this classic example. Overall, FTED world appeared with um, the filtering allows us to compute robust Boolean operations between imperfect geometries, and at the same time, produce a um, high quality volumetric mesh with clean surface. Also, it's slower than other Boolean operations for the surfaces. We tested our method on a large data set, Thinking 10K, that contains 10,000 real world surface meshes using default parameters, and our success rate achieves 99.97%. With more resources given, FTED World can achieve 100% um, success rate. Know that FTED World use, uses less than 500 megabytes for most models in the 10K dataset. Here is the running time comparison between TED World and FTED World on the whole thing in 10K dataset. The plot shows the percentage of input still unprocessed after a certain period of time. For example, after one minute, TetWild still has around 68% of the input unprocessed, while FTETWild only has 13%. And if we compute the average runtime, FTETWild is seven times faster than TetWild. Know that the mesh size of the 10K output produced by these two methods are quite similar as shown on the um, histogram. We also compared our method with the Lani based method that are known to be fast. The plot shows the comparison of Tetgen, Seagull, TetWild, and FTETWild on a reduced thing in 10K data set. These reduced data set contains only the models where the four methods are success. Um, on this data set, FTEDWorld successfully has utilized 80, sorry, 96% models within one minute, and the average runtime is only 18.5 seconds, which is comparable with the learning based methods. Since um, the output of TetWild has higher quality than most of the other methods, we compared our method with, uh, with TetWild based on 10K output using five different standard quality measures. Here we take AMIX energy as an example. The left is TetWild and the right is FTetWild. This plot shows the um, output of these two methods has similar quality and it's consistent for other quality measures. Let's now take a look at a concrete example. Uh, this surface mesh on the left has crazy self intersections that we can see in the close up and fails on uh, all other model, 
all other methods except cat wild and also our methods. It takes around 13 hours with cat wild, but with fcat wild, it only needs uh, 56 minutes and the output quality is pretty good. We also tried the extreme challenging sample I showed in the very beginning. Um, FTAT world takes only 55 minutes to generate a nice attack mesh with clean surface as shown on the right. Here is another challenging sample. The input on the left contains self-intersected beams, fine features, but in the output the, on the right, uh, the self-intersections are all gone and the thin beams are well preserved. This example shows Boolean operations between two shapes. We extract the volume of shape two from volume of shape, of shape one and get a tight mesh for the pipe carved inside. We can use this tight mesh for Stokes fluid simulation on the right. We let the fluid go through the pipe and show the streamlines. So with FTAT world, users can generate hundreds and thousands of clean meshes robustly and efficiently. With all these nice features shown before, FTAT world also has limitations. First, it handles sharp features in a soft way and cannot preserve input surface exactly. Second, FTAT world always produces a valid tight mesh encoding point, but might not insert all the input triangles. Differently, our previous work, TechWild, always inserts or uh, triangles, but might not produce a floating point mesh. But for these two methods, we don't find failure case on the 10K data set we That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, there's a quick question in the mm -hmm. YouTube live chat. So, um, so he asked, uh, although some uh, discontinuities are inevitable, such as like um, face flips, but is it, uh, is it possible to make uh, this meshing algorithm a differentiable? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. The energy is differentiable, but the algorithm probably not. Yeah, okay, thank you. And, and due to the uh, limited time, uh, we will proceed to the talk of our headliner and we'll have a joint Q&A sessions at the end of the presentation. So if you have any more questions for Yixing, please feel free to uh, leave questions in the YouTube live chat. So our headliner, Nick Sharp, is, is a final year PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University and supervised by Keenan Crane. And he works on a lot of classic geometry problems, such as finding the optimal cut on the surface and some deep side as well, such as uh, triangulating a point cloud uh, using neural net. And he also contributes to open source projects, such as some um, uh, great visualization tool called the Polyscope and the C++ library uh, called Geometry Central. And personally, it is my great pleasure to introduce Nick. He's the TA of my first geometry processing course in my life. He guides me through a lot of fundamentals in geometry processing, including a very popular data structure called half-edge data structure. But today, he's not going to talk about half edges anymore. Instead, he's going to talk about the novel signpost data structure presented in his uh, intrinsic triangulation paper. So now please join me to welcome Nick to give us a tour to the intrinsic side of geometry. All right, thank you so much, uh, Derek. And thank you everyone for inviting me here today to give this talk, I'm really excited. So first off, let me share my screen and make sure you can all, all see it. Can you see my screen? All right, are we good to go? I guess uh, perhaps you can't tell me. All right, excellent. I'll get <clears throat> I'll get going. So, oh, Zoom is yelling at me. All right, can't move my slides. Sorry, give me one moment here. Let's try one more time. Awesome, okay, can we see everything now? I'll assume somebody will stop me if we can't. So with that out of the way, uh, I'm so happy to talk today about intrinsic triangulations in geometry processing. And uh, a lot of this is joint work with Keenan Crane and Yusuf Suleiman who deserve, deserve a lot of credit for the content. So in geometry processing, we use triangle meshes often to represent surfaces. 
But as you all are probably well aware, not all triangle meshes are created equal. They can vary widely in their accuracy, their connectivity, their size, the element quality, and so on and so forth. And we've often discovered that an algorithm that works great on a mesh like the one I've shown on the left here might not work at all on a mesh like the one on the right. And this can be a big problem in geometry processing. You might say, oh, just remesh it. And there have been some amazing re advances in remeshing over the past decade, especially some of the great Tet Wild work we just saw from Yishin. But the fact remains that remeshing is a really fundamentally hard problem because it's a game of trade-offs. You're looking for one triangulation that serves two often competing goals. On one hand, you want a concise representation of the shape, but on the, on the other hand, you want a good data structure for whatever computation you're doing. And the root cause of this difficulty is a duality that underlies the meshes we work with every day. Because on one hand, meshes are data. They're shapes. They're a geometric description of some surface we care about. But on the other hand, meshes are data structures. We're going to store values on them and use their basis functions for numerical computations. And these are two separate purposes, which are often at odds with one another. Today, we'll be talking about intrinsic triangulations, which really embrace this distinction by allowing the mesh on which we compute to differ from the mesh which encodes shape. Intrinsic triangulations retain the simple Euclidean elements that we know and love, but give us the flexibility to modify the triangulation, all while still preserving the underlying shape. We'll see that this leads to brand new algorithms, applications in robust geometry processing, as well as some formal guarantees, which are very hard to come by in this space. To be clear, we definitely did not invent the idea of intrinsic triangulations. They have a long, long history going back to Rege's work in the 60s uh, using intrinsic triangulations to describe general relativity. A lot of this work has come from the mathematics community, culm culminating in a formal definition of the intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian. In the graphics community and the geometry processing community, it's been much more focused on intrinsic triangulations for conformal maps. But I really strongly believe that intrinsic triangulation should be a standard tool for applied geometry processing and that they have a really important role to play here. So the goal of our research is to develop the theory, develop the algorithms, and develop the data structures to make intrinsic triangulations an everyday tool in geometry processing. A quick outline of how this will go today. First, I'll introduce the basic idea of intrinsic triangulations and cover some core concepts. And then I'll quickly walk through three different recent research efforts on intrinsic triangulations, extending them to general inputs, offering new efficient representations, as well as a brand new algorithm using intrinsic triangulations to find exact geodesics. So let's get started with some basics. At the lowest level, the basic idea of intrinsic triangulation is to represent the geometry of a triangle mesh, not by vertex positions, but by its edge lengths. So while normally we might store the connectivity and vertex positions of a mesh, we're going to instead throw out those vertex positions and store a length associated with each edge. And that's really it. That's the whole big idea behind intrinsic triangulations. Everything that follows is about how we build on top of it and how we leverage this representation to do awesome things. But you might ask, why should this even work? Why is it even reasonable to throw out vertex positions? And to answer that, we'll first ask what makes a triangle? Really go into the basics here. The Euclidean triangles we're used to have straight lines as edges and a flat interior. And I wanna argue that when you're working on a surface, this funny bent triangle I've drawn here meets that definition. Its edges are geodesic paths, which are like straight lines on a surface, and its interior is flat in the sense that it contains no vertices or equivalently no Gaussian curvature. And what we can then do is take the three edge lengths of this triangle and lay it out in the plane. Of course, this layout is unique because a triangle shape is totally determined by its edge lengths. And we can then evaluate many quantities on, <clears throat> on this triangle in the plane, which has been laid out from edge lengths. Like we could measure its area or the angles of its corners and so on and so forth. And if we measured those same areas inscribed on the surface of the shape, they would be the same. So by computing with this triangle laid out on the plane, we really are computing <clears throat> uh, with the geometry of the actual surface, even though we just have edge lengths. And in fact, there's a whole suite of quantities that can be computed solely from edge lengths. And these are known as intrinsic quantities. They include basic ingredients like areas, angles, and Gaussian curvatures, as well as higher level geometric quantities like geodesic distance, Laplacians, parameterizations, and so on. For us, the word extrinsic will basically just refer to the remaining quantities that don't make sense to compute from edge lengths, like normals or dihedral angles. I should mention, though, that despite this intrinsic extrinsic distinction, we can actually still use intrinsic triangulations to solve many problems involving extrinsic data. And we'll talk more about that later. This intrinsic extrinsic story has deep connections to differential geometry. One of which I'll briefly mention is the idea of a cone metric, 
the geometry of our manifold is like that of a plane everywhere, except at certain special locations, which are cone points or vertices. This makes it clear that the geometry is really determined by these vertices and that the faces and edges of our triangulation are an incidental detail. So we should be able to change them. The way we'll generally get interesting intrinsic triangulations is with an operation called an intrinsic edge flip. Here, we take two triangles adjacent to some edge and we replace the edge here labeled as IK with its opposite diagonal JM. Computationally, to evaluate this, we just need to update some notion of mesh connectivity as well as also computing the new edge length, which is easy to compute from the five edge lengths we already know. And that core algorithmic operation will be enough to build almost everything we use in this talk. As we do this, the edge flips will construct, implicitly construct long bent triangles along the surface, like you see here after performing several edge flips. But I wanna emphasize that we generally won't need to explicitly represent how these triangles lay along the surface. Our representation will just be this list of edge lengths. And the edge flip will always be a cheap, easy, constant time operation, even though this sort of model is what's going on under the surface. These edge flips are popular and widely used because they have a deep connection with the Laplace operator for surfaces. If you haven't heard of, heard of it before, the Laplace matrix discretizes the Laplace operator and has a pretty standard construction via finite elements as a V by V matrix, where every edge in a triangle mesh contributes an off diagonal entry. And the value of that off diagonal entry is given by the sum of the cotangents of the opposite angle of every edge in which every triangle in which this edge appears. And this matrix is an extremely common ingredient on ge for geometry processing algorithms on surfaces. However, there is one annoying downside to this construction, which is that these weights can be negative. And this in turn can lead to numerical problems for lots of downstream algorithms. If this doesn't happen, if all the edge weights are non-negative, then we'll say <clears throat> that each non-negative edge is a Delaunay edge, meaning it has a positive cotangent weight. And if all of these weights are positive, then we'll say that it's an intrinsic Delaunay triangulation. And as you might've guessed from the name Delaunay, this is a natural generalization of the Delaunay triangulations you might've heard of in the plane. There's a beautiful relationship between this Delaunay property and intrinsic triangulations because a super simple algorithm lets us transform any input triangulation into an intrinsic Delaunay triangulation. That algorithm is just, well, any edge is not Delaunay, while it has a negative cotangent weight, you flip it. And amazingly, this will provably terminate with an intrinsic Delaunay mesh. So an example of that you can see here, we have an initial mesh given by the black wireframe, which is a CAD model. Then after performing these edge flip, flips, we get the intrinsic triangulation given by the colored triangles. And this has been the main use of intrinsic triangulations thus far, is to say when you want a Laplace matrix for a shape, you can first perform these intrinsic edge flips and get an intrinsic triangulation and build your Laplace operator from that intrinsic triangulation. And this is a much better Laplace operator. In fact, even when you don't particularly care about the Delaunay property, it still turns out that this Laplace matrix makes a bunch of algorithms work better than the standard cotangent Laplace matrix. And one way to understand why is that we're kind of building a better set of basis functions here. In particular, it's known that this intrinsic Delaunay triangulation maximizes the minimum angle in any triangle, which reduces the condition number of the matrix. It's also known that it reduces the prevalence of obtuse angles, which improves the approximation of gradients. So for instance, if we had some initial mesh which with basis functions at vertices that look like these blue functions here, after performing intrinsic edge flips, we're sort of implicitly constructing a new set of basis functions shown here. And this might, for instance, improve the approximation of a Dirichlet energy. It's important to remember that these are still piecewise linear basis functions, not some fancy custom optimized set of higher order basis functions. This is really useful because we've derived a ton of algorithms using piecewise linear basis functions and they still apply on this intrinsic Delaunay representation. In practice, this intrinsic Delaunay uh, Laplace matrix makes a lot of algorithms just work better. Examples here include vector fields, parameterizations, and geodesic distance, and we'll be showing a lot more. The common theme here is that we're computing quantities defined along a surface, and this will generally be the setting where intrinsic triangulations are most easy, easily applied. For me, this is really exciting because it's a rare opportunity where we kind of get to wave a magic wand and make a whole bunch of geometry processing algorithms from the past decades just sort of automatically work better. So it's really cool in that sense. To recap, the core properties of intrinsic triangulations is that we're going to represent geometry by edge lengths rather than vertex positions. And this edge length representation turns out to be sufficient to evaluate many quantities and algorithms and even use existing algorithms out of the box.
we'll use intrinsic edge flips to transform triangulations. And it's really important that I always mean an intrinsic edge flip, like we see on the right in this image here, not ever an extrinsic edge flip. And doing these intrinsic edge flips is great because it exactly preserves the geometry of the underlying shape. We don't have to worry about approximation error or anything like that because we're exactly preserving the underlying piecewise flat geometry. One other thing to mention is that the resulting algorithms in this space end up being really, really fast because computationally, these edge flips are just simple local mesh operations. Pretty much every algorithm we're going to see in this talk runs in a few milliseconds, even on large, difficult inputs. All right. So with the core concepts explained, now let's move on to looking at some recent research. And the first thing I want to talk about <clears throat> is some of our work extending intrinsic triangulations to, ex to apply to a more general class of inputs, which appeared at SGP this past summer. The perspective we'll take here is of robustness as a subroutine. And the metaphor I'd like you to think about is that of linear solvers. When you go to solve maybe some sparse linear system, AX equals B, in MATLAB or SciPy or Eigen or your favorite language, it gets pushed through some black box solver, which might be doing fancy things like permutations uh, or, or who knows what. And at the end, it gives you out a good high quality solution to that linear system. And you don't have to know how it worked. And it's really important that we build up the same kind of machinery in geometry processing, where if you want to say, solve a PDE on a surface, then you should be able to efficiently and robustly solve this PDE without having to think about exactly what's going on. And we think that intrinsic triangulations can serve a core role as one of these tools for providing robustness as a subroutine. In particular, one way to look at intrinsic Laplacians is to say that they're just a magic machine for building a really, really awesome high quality Laplace matrix. If you want to use this matrix in some higher level application, it doesn't actually matter to you how it was built or precisely what it means, just that it's a great V by V sparse Laplace matrix. However, there is classically one sticking point to using our intrinsic triangulations in that way, which has to do with non-manifold meshes. If you're not familiar, being non-manifold basically just means that in a local region, your mesh doesn't look like the plane. So here we have non-manifold vertices and edges, which are both little regions where the mesh doesn't look like a slice of the plane. Non-manifold meshes sometimes arise as bugs, where you have a surface that really should be manifold, but due to some prior step of an algorithm, you unfortunately have a non-manifold mesh. But it's important to handle these because they somehow keep on cropping up as outputs of previous algorithms, and it's good to be robust. Also, sometimes we want to compute on shapes which are just outright non-manifold, such as soap films or level sets of multiple interacting liquids. If you try to do this with intrinsic triangulations, there's a big problem because we can't flip non-manifold edges. Just looking at it, it's clear that there's no obvious edge flip operation to perform here. And this would stop us from building the intrinsic tr Delaunay triangulation and building the awesome corresponding Laplace matrix. The insight of this work was that we can build what we call a tufted cover of the surface and compute the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation on that cover to get this Laplace matrix. So in particular, given some input mesh, which might be non-manifold, we construct a particular cover of the surface, build the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation on that cover, and then use the Laplacian of this intrinsic Delaunay triangulation as the Laplacian of our original mesh. We call this the tufted cover because it reminds us of tufted upholstery, where the little buttons are like vertices. So to give you a quick visual of how we construct this, imagine we start with some non-manifold mesh like I've shown here. Then what we'll do is we'll split each face in half. This, me this mesh has one non-manifold edge at the center. And we'll split each face in half and then glue them together in a cyclic order about the center edge. Now we have twice as many faces, but the same number of vertices as we started with. This glued mesh is great because our one non-manifold edge became three manifold edges. And now we can perform our intrinsic Delaunay edge flip. So what happened here is that we actually resolved all non-manifold edges in the triangulation by the way we constructed the cover. We actually created non-manifold vertices all over the place. But it turns out that that's not actually a problem, because non-manifold vertices don't affect the construction of the Laplace matrix. To be clear, we didn't magically make a non-manifold mesh manifold. If you want to do something like define tangent spaces, you still need to think about that separately. What we did do was we gave the mesh exactly the structure it needs to build the intrinsic Delaunay Laplace matrix. And this really allows, <clears throat> allows the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation to serve a very useful role as, for robustness as a subroutine. Given any triangle mesh, which might even be non-manifold, we can build the tufted cover, perform intrinsic Delaunay edge flips, and read off a high quality Laplace matrix. 
Because we didn't touch the ver vertex set, this is still a V by V matrix with the same degrees of freedom. So it's a drop-in replacement for any algorithms you might be running on the original mesh. Before we get into higher level examples of why this works, I want to talk about one really important basic low-level property. A task you might try to do with, in, with a Laplace matrix is to perform interpolation on so, some domain. And this intrinsic Delaunay tufted cover Laplacian uh, gives you a really strong guarantee of bounded interpolation. So to give an example, suppose we have a simple, simple triangle mesh in the plane. And this is just what it looks like. It's just a manifold mesh with boundary sitting in the plane. And suppose we have values of 0 and 1 known at two marked vertices. And we want to interpolate that data to the rest of the shape. If we were to simply impose constraints and solve a harmonic Dirichlet boundary value problem to extend the data, this would lead to values much greater than one up in the whole top region of the shape. Using the standard intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian doesn't actually help <clears throat> because the offending edge is a boundary edge. However, if we build our tufted intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian, we get an extremely strong guarantee that all of the associated edge weights are positive, even at the boundary. And this means that the result of the interpolation problem will always be bounded by the range of the inputs, which is what you'd probably expect. Now, if you're a student of PDEs, you might know that it's actually ill-posed to impose point constraints on a problem like this. But nonetheless, it's a very practical and pragmatic thing to want to do discreetly. So we think that this is a really useful guarantee. It's kind of cool because we started out thinking about non-manifold meshes and ended up getting a new and powerful discrete guarantee, even for manifold meshes, as long as they have boundary. Moving on to some higher level problems, we can use this Laplacian to find minimal surfaces. This is great because it gives robustness to really poor quality triangles and even avoids local extrema in the solution, which don't really make sense when you're finding a minimal <coughs> surface. This is a good example of a problem of an extrinsic problem that we can solve despite the fact that we're working with intrinsic triangulations. Once we've built a really great intrinsic operator, we can just apply it to extrinsic data. This is a common situation that makes intrinsic triangulations beneficial for many extrinsic problems despite the name. We can keep doing this and look at differential surface editing. So here we have a triangle mesh of this goose, which was a result of a low quality mesh Boolean operation and has non-manifold edges all over the place, which are marked in red. What we've done now is we've placed some sparse handles on the surface and we want to deform the shape at the handles and interpolate the de deformation across the rest of the domain. If we do this naively using a standard algorithm, we get essentially numerical nonsense because of the poor quality of the Laplace matrix. Simply building the intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian using our tufted cover and swapping it into the algorithm allows us to get the expected result. One more numerical technique I want to talk about here is something we call intrinsic mollification. The tufted cover helps us handle bad connectivity in low quality meshes, but a separate danger is that our inputs might be degenerate and floating point. And I don't just mean skinny triangles, we've been handling those all along. I mean meshes that are so degenerate, we can't even do basic arithmetic with them in floating point. Intrinsic mollification is a simple and very pragmatic workaround. In the intrinsic setting, numerical degeneracy shows up as edge lengths, which fail to satisfy the triangle inequality, or maybe just barely satisfy the triangle inequality in floating point. With intrinsic mollification, we just add a tiny, carefully chosen epsilon to every edge length. And this will, by definition, resolve these, uh, these failures to satisfy the triangle inequality. Of course, this does slightly change the geometry, but in practice, the change is utterly negligible. You might say, this is so simple. Why are you even telling me about this? But I think it's interesting because it's simple and because it's something that's only possible in the intrinsic setting. There's no corresponding operation with vertex positions because wiggling a vertex to make one degeneracy better might make another degeneracy worse. Whereas in the intrinsic setting, we have this simple operation that makes everything in a numerical sense better. Coupled with our tufted cover, this allows us to construct a high quality intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian for every mesh in the Thingy 10K, 10K data set, which includes many degenerate non-manifold meshes. And before we move on, there's one last thing I want to talk about here, which is that it turns out this, in, this Ability to build this Laplacian on non-manifold meshes is exactly is actually exactly what we need to build a high-quality point cloud Laplacian. And I'll just cover this really briefly so you know that it exists. We start out by doing something that's fairly standard with point cloud Laplacian, which is for each point, we take the neighbors and project them into a tangent plane. And then we build a little tiny local planar triangulation where we only care about the triangles that are touching the center point. <clears throat> 
the union of all of these triangles is some gigantic crazy triangulation which has many overlapping triangles it's non-manifold all over the place it's really terrible but our tufted cover doesn't care we can still build the intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian for this crazy mesh and use that as our point cloud Laplacian this turns out to be super effective because there are no parameters to tune. It has great sparsity and generally behaves like the triangle mesh Laplacians we know and love. So this makes it really easy to adapt algorithms developed for meshes to point clouds. Two quick examples of this. We use that the Laplacian to compute a spectral conformal parameterization on a point cloud, as well as to compute the logarithmic map, which is a particular local parameterization about the point. The takeaway here is that intrinsic Delaunay triangulations are a really fantastic tool, and the intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian is super useful. By providing some sort of carefully set up machinery, we're now allowing you to build these intrinsic Delaunay Laplacians on any triangle mesh or even point clouds. And we're hoping that this broader set of applicability will further promote their use in practice. So thus far, we've just been talking about building this intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian. Now let's go back to the comfortable realm of manifold triangle meshes and talk about a slightly richer representation for intrinsic triangulations, which will open the door to a lot of tasks beyond just building this Laplace matrix. And this work appeared in Navigating Intrinsic Triangulations at SIGGRAPH 2019. Let's return to this basic idea of representing intrinsic geometry. As we said, the sort of starting point idea is to just store the length of every edge. And this is great because it's simple and it's easy to update, but it's in some sense an abstract representation. It's great if you just want to build the Laplace matrix, but it might leave you wondering, how do we make this picture? Just knowing the length of every edge doesn't tell you how the intrinsic triangles lay across the surface. This not only stops you from visualization, but perhaps more importantly, it stops you from implementing higher level algorithms that might want to work with tangent vectors or know some correspondence between the intrinsic triangulation and the original mesh. So if we want to unlock these higher level tasks, we're going to need to track just a little bit more data than just edge lengths. The first idea might be to explicitly store the location where each intrinsic edge lays across some edge of the original mesh. And this strategy does work, and it does encode a complete correspondence. But the downside is that it's fairly complicated to implement, and it's computationally expensive to update, as you say, do edge flips. What we propose is an alternate strategy which augments the edge lengths with directions. This turns out to be very simple to implement and easy to update, and it also encodes a complete correspondence. And it turns out to also synergize really great with representing tangent vector data. So we call this data structure the signpost intrinsic triangulation. <clears throat> and as I said, the basic idea is to just, in addition to edge lengths, store a tangent direction of every edge in the basis of each vertex with that edge touches. And we call this signpost because it's really quite like signposts you might see in a city. These signposts tell you to trace out an edge in any particular direction along a surface. It tells you how long to walk, the direction of the edge, or sorry, the length of the edge, and also what direction to walk in. These signposts are kind of an implicit lazy representation. Whenever you want to know the actual path an edge takes, you just trace it out along the surface. And this tracing is a quick, easy operation that's basically just a bunch of 2D line line intersections. It's very easy and cheap to evaluate. Because this, these signposts are just a constant amount of data, they can easily be updated in constant time, and our edge flips end up being really, really fast operations. In fact, we took this opportunity to do some of the first large scale studies on the efficiency of this edge flipping operation to build the intrinsic Delaunay Laplace matrix. On the theory side, there's only really pessimistic worst case bounds for the time complexity of this operation. But in practice, we find that it's basically a linear time procedure, even on supposedly difficult inputs. For instance, here, we took every mesh in the, every manifold mesh in the Thingy 10K data set and performed edge flips until we got the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation. On the lower axis are the number of edges, on the top axis are the number of flips it took, and each point is one mesh. You see that the number of flips required is never more than a small fraction of the number of edges or at least a small factor of the number of edges. And there are basically no outliers. And these are on CAD meshes, which are usually kind of the pathological difficult inputs for these kind of algorithms. In practice, these edge flips usually take less time than just reading a mesh from, from disk. Perhaps more importantly than efficiency, these signposts make it easy to implement a whole range of standard mesh processing style operations on intrinsic triangulations beyond just edge flips. I won't go into all of these one at a time in this talk, but you can find recipes for all these kinds of operations in the paper. The sort of overall story here is that the implicit representation makes these operations easy.
One of these operations, which is particularly important though, is the ability to insert new vertices into the intrinsic triangulation. And this is really useful because we can perform intrinsic Delaunay refinement and insert new vertices to avoid skinny triangles. So for instance, if we have this mesh as input and we perform intrinsic Delaunay edge flips, we'll get this mesh again, where the intrinsic triangles are given by the colored faces. But notice that it still has some pretty skinny triangles in it, as well as a poor distribution of vertices. Once we can do refinement and insert new vertices, we can just borrow to choose second algorithm from planar geometry, which basically amounts to just repeatedly alternating between flipping the mesh to be Delaunay and then inserting one vertex at the circumcenter of some skinny triangle. This yields the mesh you see on the right here, which now has a great distribution of triangles. And in fact, it even has a bounded angle guarantee. There are no corner angles skinnier than 30 degrees in this triangulation. This is really exciting because it's pretty much an awesome mesh to do simulation on. It has the Delaunay property, it has no skinny angles, a good distribution of vertices. We can build this mesh in a fraction of a second, and all the while it exactly preserves the underlying geometry of the domain. So we really got something powerful in return for moving to the intrinsic viewpoint when thinking about our triangulations. To see how this, apply, how this works out in some applications, we can solve a few example PDEs. One of which is the heat method, which is a fastest approximate scheme for computing geodesic distance. If we run the scheme naively on the input mesh, we get a gigantic mean error of 60% because it's a really poor quality triangulation. Just performing intrinsic Delaunay edge flips takes the error down to 20% and gives us something that's starting to look like a distance function. But performing this intrinsic Delaunay refinement takes the error down to less than 1%, and we hardly even needed to double the number of vertices. This is really exciting. We can play a similar game working with tangent <coughs> vector data, which is particularly enabled by the signpost representation. Here we're interpolating vectors from the boundary, which amounts to solving a Laplace problem. If you do this naively with the cotangent Laplacian, these negative edge weights can cause flipped vectors, which I've circled in red. Here the vector points in the opposite direction of what you'd think it should, and this can cause big problems for your algorithms downstream. Using the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation guarantees that this will never happen. So the high level takeaway from the signpost data structure is that it's a fast, simple strategy that unlocks some of these higher level algorithms with intrinsic triangulations. From just simply visualizing them, to higher level algorithmic tasks like tracking a correspondence or doing intrinsic Delaunay refinement. You can do a lot more things when you have a representation that's still fast and efficient, but richer than just edge lengths. <clears throat> so now I wanna move even farther away from the classical work and talk about a totally new algorithm that we came up with making use of intrinsic triangulations. And unlike the previous work, this one's really interesting because it has nothing to do with the Delaunay property. Whereas almost all past work on intrinsic triangulations was rooted in the Delaunay property. We're going to show you how can, you can use intrinsic triangulations to find uh, exact geodesic paths on triangle meshes. And this will be appearing at SIGGRAPH Asia coming up soon. So we're going to be looking at geodesics. And geodesics are paths along a surface, which are like straight lines or shortest paths. And these paths are widely useful for remeshing, analysis, and so on. In particular, uh, we'll be looking at exact geodesics along piecewise flat surfaces, so not some smoothed approximation. And here we'll actually be concerned with finding locally shortest geodesics, which is as opposed to the more general task of, or sorry, the more specific task of finding globally shortest geodesics or computing geodesic distance. It turns out that we'll be able to transform a given curve into a locally shortest geodesic using just a simple edge flipping strategy. And this is going to be totally different from past algorithms in this space. So in general, a geodesic can be an arbitrary polyline along the surface of a mesh. But we're going to do something kind of weird and different here and represent curves only as sequences of edges in the triangulation, more akin to a path in the graph theory sense. Initially, this sounds way too restrictive. We'd never be able to find geodesics in this representation. But remember, with intrinsic triangulations, we can change the edges of the triangulation. So there is at least some hope. To be precise, our algorithm will take as input a path along the edges of a mesh, or more generally, a loop or a network of paths. So I've shown one example on the right here where the path is given in red. Our algorithm will shorten this path, pulling it tight to produce an exact locally shortest geodesic. The output will be isotopic to the input, which basically means that the path can be topologically transformed from what we started with to what we got as output. The output path will always be a sequence of edges in an intrinsic triangulation. And it turns out that this intrinsic triangulation also has separate value on its own right. I think the easiest way to think about this is to see it in action. 
So here's a quick video on a fairly fine mesh where I've initially drawn this red curve as a path along edges. And here our algorithm is doing edge flips and edge flips and edge flips in the triangulation, pulling the curve tight until it's a geodesic. And in real time, this takes just a few milliseconds. Notice that here, the geodesic we generate is not the shortest geodesic between these two points, but it's more like the result of a curve shortening flow on the initial curve. To describe how this algorithm works, we'll need a little bit more terminology. In particular, we need to think about when a path along the edges of a triangulation is a geodesic. Well, the edges of our intrinsic triangulations are already always geodesics between vertices. So the interior of our edges is fine. We only need to think about what happens at the vertices where these edges meet. So in particular here again on the right, the path has been drawn as in red uh, and it's passing through some vertex labeled I. If we measure the two angles swept out by the path on either side of this vertex, if both of those angles are greater than pi, then the path is geodesic because no local perturbation can make it shorter. And this definition is consistent with a lot of past work on the subject. Our algorithm is then basically just a greedy strategy to ensure that this property holds at each joint of the path. So we call this procedure the flip out subroutine because it literally flips edges out of the vertex ring in order to introduce a shorter path. So in particular, consider some vertex where our path makes an <clears throat> takes a turn and makes an angle greater than pi. So here the path is given by the red dotted line. It passes through the vertex V or the vertex B and I've, I've laid out some of the triangles in the vertex ring into the plane here. <clears throat> what our algorithm is gonna do is it's gonna look at each edge from B to some other vertex I. So each of the outgoing, <clears throat> outgoing edges from the center vertex B and consider this swept out angle labeled beta uh, along the outer perimeter of the triangle triangulation. The algorithm is just, if any of these angles beta are less than pi, then we flip the edge from B to I and that's it. When this procedure terminates, the path along the outer boundary is necessarily shorter than the path we started with. And that's what makes our whole algorithm work. So to see this in action, we start out with some, <clears throat> again here, uh, path gamma, which is the red dotted line from A to B to C. It's making a left turn at this vertex, so it's not yet a geodesic. We notice that this angle beta is less than pi, so we flip the edge. We check this angle, see that it's greater than pi, so we don't touch that edge. We check this next angle, see that it's again less than pi, so we flip the edge. And then finally, at the conclusion here, this red dotted line along the outer perimeter uh, is shorter than the path that we started with. And in fact, we proved that this will always work. This will always be the case that after performing this procedure, the path along the boundary will be shorter than the path you started with. And that's all you really need from the subroutine. To give you a quick outline of how this <clears throat> proofs work, proof works, well, first we need to argue that we can always flip the edges. And that follows because the diamond containing the edge we're about to flip is always convex. We need to argue that this flipping procedure terminates, which follows because every time we do an edge flip, we remove one edge from the vertex neighborhood. Finally, we need to argue that after this procedure terminates, we have a shorter curve. This follows because once all of these beta angles labeled beta are greater than pi, then the curve along the outer boundary, which is now a yellow line in this picture, is going to be a convex curve. And a classic geometry theorem called the containment of convex curves tells us that whenever two convex curves are nested inside of one another, the inner convex curve is always shorter. And you can prove this, for instance, with the Crofton formula. Now, a big part of our, uh, our, our contribution here is actually to prove that this holds even on a super general delta complex, uh, which is a little bit technical to describe. And the takeaway here, though, is just that the proof still holds. And the algorithm works exactly as stated, even on a very general delta complex. And this is what allows us to give really strong discrete guarantees that this algorithm always works. So now that we have a subroutine that allows us to always make a path, introduce a shorter path about a little piece of a, introduce a shorter path about a little area where the path is not yet geodesic, then we can just repeatedly apply this subroutine, making the path shorter and shorter and shorter until eventually it is a geodesic. So here's two examples where I took two initial paths given in light red and transformed them to geodesic paths in dark red. And we can do the same thing exactly as stated on loops too. There's one extra small case you need to handle for loops, but I'll refer you to the paper for that because it's not that interesting. Really the only other piece of algorithm machinery we need is a little bit of bookkeeping to keep track of things with coincident curves, which sit atop the same edge of the triangulation. This allows us to handle things like this funky path, which wraps around a cylinder five times, 
but we can still straighten to be a geodesic. Or this path on the bottom, which gets caught on itself while straightening. In practice, this algorithm is super fast. Algorithmically, we have a proof that it always yields an, an exact geo geodesic in a finite number of operations. And in practice, runtimes are usually just a few milliseconds. In fact, running the straightening procedure is generally going to have a negligible cost compared to whatever procedure generated the path. So for instance, it might be common to find an initial path using Dijkstra's algorithm, then straighten it with this flip-out procedure. And the flip-out procedure will be on average 10 times faster than just running Dijkstra's algorithm. And this kind of surprised me because I tend to think of geodesics as being the scary expensive quantity. But in this case, they're negligible compared to Dijkstra's algorithm, which is kind of remarkable. Once you can straighten curves, you actually have all the machinery you need to also find Bezier curves. So here, a simple de castle style subdivision procedure allows you, us to construct Bezier curves from control points. As always, all of the curves you see here are the edges of an intrinsic triangulation on the surface, which I haven't drawn. We can also more generally straighten not just curves or loops, but networks of curves or loops. And this is really important because networks of curves along edges show up pretty often in geometry processing. For instance, when cutting a shape to flatten it, uh, you might have a curve network connecting marked comb points. And what we can do is run our algorithm to straighten these edges to geodesics rather than jagged lines along edges, which might be much more natural if we're trying to fabricate a cut object. Similarly, a segmentation along faces probably has jagged edges as a boundary, which you don't actually want. So we can straighten these edges to be more like geodesics. The key property of our algorithm here is that it provably maintains the topology of the curves, or more precisely, preserves the isotopy class. This is important because it guarantees that the curves will never cross over each other as they're being straightened. For instance, if you, <clears throat> if you cause these curves, which were the boundary of the segmentation, to cross over each other while straightening, you'd make the output meaningless. So you really want this guarantee from your algorithm. The, uh, the astute eye might realize that as we run this algorithm, we produce some pretty crazy, extremely skinny triangles in the triangulation. And amazingly, we found the algorithm to be plenty robust numerically, despite the existence of these super skinny triangles. In fact, in our experiments, it was more robust than past techniques. Some intuition for why this isn't really much of an issue is that these skinny triangles are not really different from the narrow windows which appeared in past window-based methods like MMP. So the situation here is really no different from past algorithms for geodesics. It's just that we can see the skinny triangles or skinny windows now, and they look really scary. Fortunately, if we want to compute with the triangulation, we can always just do some quick Delaunay refinement to generate a high quality intrinsic triangulation. And this is particularly important because this algorithm is sort of the missing link to unlocked constrained intrinsic triangulation along surfaces. So in the plane, we might have some input graph of points and lines, and we might use classic tools to generate its constrained Delaunay triangulation or even Delaunay refinement. This flip out algorithm lets us do the same thing on surfaces, where we can draw some collection of points and paths between them on a surface and generate an intrinsic triangulation, which not only conforms to these geodesics, but also gives a high quality intrinsic triangulation to compute with after refinement. This allows us to easily, really easily do things like use geodesics as boundary conditions for PDEs. So here on the top, I have computed a cross field, which takes its boundary conditions from geodesics that were drawn on the surface and straightened using our algorithm. Or on the bottom, we solve a Poisson problem, where the problem takes Dirichlet boundary conditions from a Bezier curve drawn on a mechanical part. And as we're wrapping up here, I want to kick this up just one more notch before we finish. You might also want to take this even further and use our algorithm to find geodesics paths not between two points, but from one vertex to all other vertices in a mesh. And it turns out that you can do this by essentially just running Dijkstra's algorithm on the frontier of a, or running Dijkstra's algorithm and constantly performing the flip-out procedure at the frontier of the Dijkstra search. So on this mesh, we have some source vertex we care about. And running this procedure yields a geodesic edge to every other vertex in the triangulation. Now, of course, these are still only guaranteed to be locally shortest geodesics. But in practice, they're very often, more than 90% of the time, the globally shortest geodesics. And this procedure takes just a few milliseconds. To me, though, the really interesting thing is that we've constructed a single, single intrinsic triangulation with the same number of vertices, which simultaneously contains a geodesic from the source to every other vertex in the mesh. And it's kind of crazy to me that this triangulation even exists. You can even take this a step further and read off the angles of these edges to all the other vertices and get a discretization of the polyhedral logarithmic map. 
So to me, this is super exciting because we're applying intrinsic triangulations to a really new task, which has nothing to do with the Delaunay property. And doing so yields a new algorithm for the pretty well-trodden problem of geodesics on triangle meshes. I'm super optimistic that there are more problems out there in geometry processing, just waiting for solutions with intrinsic triangulations. So now I'll start wrapping up here. And just to recap a little bit, remember that intrinsic triangulations are meshes where we track the edge lengths rather than vertex positions. This gives us a lot of possibilities for new algorithms and has some great applications to robust geometry processing. We looked at three examples of recent research on these algorithms, including a generalization to non-manifold meshes and point clouds, uh, our signpost data structure, and a brand new algorithm for finding ge geodesics via edge flips. There's still a lot of work to do in this space. A few things I'm particularly excited about include the use of exact predicates with intrinsic triangulations, because exact predicates have proven so important for meshing in the plane and in space. A coarsening operation, can we remove the vertices in an intrinsic triangulation? As well as deeper finite element perspectives, and even more broadly thinking about doing intrinsic tetrahedra rather than intrinsic triangulations. There are some uh, initial non-results with tetrahedra, but I still think that there might be something to find there. Uh, we've got a lot of code available in C++ and Python, including Geometry Central, which is a general purpose library for geometry with good support for intrinsic triangulations, as well as demos in C++ and Python packages on the Python package index uh, that allow you to build this high quality intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian for meshes and point clouds. And the code for these flipped geodesics is coming soon. So with that, I'll wrap up and thank all of the organizers for organizing this amazing colloquium, which I'm very excited for the remaining sessions over the remainder of the month. Uh, and thank everyone for listening here, uh, as well as Yishin for contributing the amazing opening talk. Uh, so thanks a bunch. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions now or in the future about any of this stuff. I love getting emails. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick. And thank you, Yishin, for the great talks. And we're glad to see that there are a lot of uh, questions in the chat. And we'll try to go through them. But sorry for those that we won't get uh, into due to a limited time. So first, it's a, it's a question for Yishin. And so one question is to ask, what is the floating point mesh you mean uh, at the end of your slide? Uh, the floating point mesh means that the output mesh, uh, the coordinates of the vertices in the mesh are all represented in floating points instead of using rationals. Oh, cool. cool. And, and there's a question for Nick, is that uh, have you tried to run this uh, geodesic algorithm on non-manifold meshes? That's a great, great question. Uh, no, that's not something we've done much of yet. So naively, you can. You can take this tufted cover and run the geodesic algorithm on it. The one funny thing is that then the result you get out will depend on the particular construction of the cover, which perhaps is not what you'd expect. So you can do it, but it's maybe not what you'd hope for out of the box. But that's a really interesting thing to keep thinking about. Cool. And there's another question for Yixing, is mm -hmm. that uh, you have a previous paper on the try while and we're just curious whether you could also insert some curve constraints on, on your app tech while. Yeah, we are actually working on a curved version of um, Pet Wild and uh, yeah, we, we are trying to do that. Hopefully it will <laughs> succeed. Yeah. Cool. And uh, the next question is for Nick. Uh, is that, have you tried to uh, simulate a classic physical PDEs like wave equations on non-manifold meshes um, using your non-manifold Laplacian, uh, how will the solution behave? Uh, was it corresponding to some smooth theory? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and I actually have a slide here with some things about that. So if you can still see, yeah, you can still see my screen. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so the non-manifold Laplacian is a really, really deep and interesting question. I think you could spend a whole talk just talking about what a non-manifold Laplacian and what it means, what it means, because classically you define the Laplacian local coordinates. But it does turn out that using a Laplace operator is totally meaningful, even on non-manifold domains. You just maybe want to think of it as being a devi deviation from an average value in a, in a geodesic ball. And this certainly makes sense, even on non-manifold domains, or even just as a variation of surface area, which is another way to characterize the Laplacian that makes plenty sense on non-manifold domains. Or physically, the one we did think about is heat diffusion on a metal plate, or even just more simply thinking about interpolating values. Um, so one way to maybe convince ourselves that this really is a physically meaningful operator. Um, here we did an example where we took a non-manifold object and we slightly thickened it out and then tet meshed it and solved a, a harmonic interpolation problem, both using standard, uh, standard finite element tools on the thickened volume mesh, as well as using our non-manifold uh, intrinsic triangulation on the surface mesh. 
and the results agree incredibly closely. So I don't actually have any examples to show with a wave equation specifically, uh, but we did think a lot about this sort of physical characterization of the non-manifold Laplacian and why it makes sense. Thank you. And there's another question for Nick, is that uh, there was a paper about like Laplacian with no free launch, and mm -hmm. where they say that uh, the convergence of intrinsic Laplacian is not clear. And can you comment on that? Yeah, that's actually, <laughs> these, these are great questions. These are, these are really fantastic and all things we've thought about. Uh, so there's this really amazing, uh, wonderful paper about Laplacians and free lunches, which for others who might not be aware of it, basically says that no, Lapla no discrete Laplace matrix can achieve all three, all four, simultaneously achieve symmetry, locality, linearity, and positive edge weights. Um, and this, these theorems are absolutely true. Um, and the place where this uh, intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian fails, this is locality. But I would sort of argue that the definition of locality used in this, uh, this theorem is sort of maybe not the most meaningful definition of locality in practice. Because here lo in this theorem, locality means locality in the graph sense on the triangulation you were given. Whereas we're building a Laplacian that still has the same number of neighbors. It doesn't have any extra neighbors or anything like that. And in fact, in a geometric sense, it will sort of provably be as local as possible. For instance, it says things like the nearest neighbor will always be connected in the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation. So in a sense, we've sort of circumvented this, this theorem by using a definition of locality, which is slightly different from what the, what the theorem uses. Um, and then I got a little bit distracted because I was so excited about this theorem because I love it. The, what was the precise question? Um, they said about the convergence of the intrinsic Laplacian. I see. So yeah, I don't necessarily have anything new to say on that front. Um, the interesting thing about the intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian is maybe not so much how it behaves under refinement, but rather the discrete guarantees it gives you away from refinement. It's saying that even on a coarse, a coarse triangulation that you might start with, we're still going to give you discrete invariants you expect of the Laplacian, like having all positive off-diagonal entries. Um, and these hold even away from the limit of refinement. But in the limit of refinement, it probably behaves more similarly to just the standard cotangent Laplacian. Although I, I don't have something formal to say to back that up. So maybe this should really just be an area for ongoing research. Cool. And we have a last question for both of you. Is that both intrinsic triangulation and f tat well, and both can handle some messy data in the wild. Basically, they all contribute to robust geometry processing. But kind of in a different way, and wants to build some operator directly on the messy data, and the other ones to robustly clean up the data for, for other process. And we are just curious, could you both uh, comment on how uh, the other ones work, complement on your own? And perhaps uh, Yixin can start? Yeah, I think the increased mesh can directly work on the surface mesh, and uh, uh, probably it's more efficient if the users only want to a clean surface instead of um, generating volumetric mesh. Yes. Mm. Cool. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I totally agree with the the premise of this question, and these are very much you know sort of complementary works. So one thing that the Tet Wild things uh, does that we don't do at all in intrinsic triangulations is it repairs surfaces, right? If you give me a surface that's not connected when it should be connected building an intrinsic triangulation is not going to change that and it's not going to help. Whereas the Tet Wild and these tetrahedral methods can actually sort of see through that and repair and give you the surface you really wanted despite a connectivity failure. So I think there's definitely many, many good use cases for both. I see. And um, because of the time, we didn't go through all the questions. And if you still um, want to get the answer, please feel free to email the authors. They I think they will be uh, happy to answer that. And mm -hmm. so for now, let's uh, thank everyone for for uh, coming to this colloquium. And oh, by the way, Nick, could you please uh, stop the screen sharing? Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. So, so thanks everyone for coming to this colloquium. And let's thank our speakers again. And, and one important thing uh, we need to mention is that uh, the great, great poster for this week is designed by Josh Holonetti, which is a grad student at the University of Toronto. And let's thank him for making such a great poster. Thank you everyone for coming. And I just wanted to remind you to tune in next week for a great discussion on deep uh, geometric deep learning featuring Rana Hanoka and Leo Jared. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>